Um, okay. You have now all been warned that we are being recorded again. Welcome to our fourth day, fourth talk in the Quantum Gravity Across Approaches Observables series. Today, it's our great pleasure to have Kasia Reisner speaking. Kasia finished her PhD at the University of Hamburg 2011 in just two years, which I'm seriously amazed by. After that, she stayed there for a year of postdoc and then went for two more years postdoc in Rome. And then she got a lectureship in at the University of York, where she's been since 2013 and has just been promoted to reader last autumn. She is also an Aminota Fellow at the Perimeter Institute, and her research interests are algebraic quantum field theory with a sprinkling of quantum gravity here and there. Most recently, a few dips into causal set theory, which means I've had more opportunities to talk to her, which is always a delight. Tonight, she'll tell us about non-local observables in quantum gravity from the algebraic quantum field theory perspective. As usual, short understanding questions can be asked in the chat and will be discussed at a suitable point. Um, longer questions and discussions will be left for after the talk and I will take the liberty to interrupt if I think that what you're trying to say should better go after the talk. So um, take it away, Kasia, thank you. All right, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to talk at this great seminar and for this very kind introduction, Lisa. Um, yeah, so non-local observables, this is uh, one of uh, my favorite topics, so I want to share some of my ideas with you. Um, I will try to keep it as non-technical as possible, uh, and please do interrupt me with questions if you need some short uh, clarifications, as you just said. Uh, so I will start with some introduction into perturbative activity, which is uh, the approach to quantum field theory and other things. Uh, I prefer, uh, and then I will talk about uh, various kinds of observables. So, okay, uh, this is uh, just to start things off. Well, on the uh, road to quantum gravity, there is also quantum field theory on Earth space time. Let me just remind you uh, all the trouble that one uh, encounters on that road. So, uh, if you just want to include the fact of general relativity into quantum field theory, uh, you should be able to describe quantum fields on a fixed uh, curve background. And uh, obviously, this is some approximation of you know what should be the uh, real theory of physics, which is quantum gravity in the pool. But here already we have some problems. In the absence of symmetries, for example, uh, there is no good uh, concept of the vacuum. I mean, there are some concepts of the vacuum, but uh, they're always missing <laughs> some uh, good properties. Uh, so we are never in such a great situation as we are in Minkowski space time. And obviously uh, the problem with the vacuum implies also the problem with particles because, well, yeah, uh, so we don't have no particle states. So we don't also have uh, n particle states. Other technical difficulties, well, there's a problem with big rotation. This cannot generically be, be done. Um, and there are also problems with Fourier transform. The last two things are mainly technical, but many of the quantum field theory tools actually rely on the possibility of doing so, so working in the Euclidean signature or working in the momentum space. So QFT on curve space length makes our life already difficult. Uh, and this is where I think the algebraic approach is quite useful because in algebraic approach, the life is already difficult. So having curved space time is actually not uh, making things too much worse. And uh, okay, well, there's a lot of people that contributed to it. So uh, I have no, not enough room to uh, list them all, but I just want to mention Hollands and Wald, René Fifren, Hagen, Kai, and um, contributions. And the idea is that, well, there is the AQFT framework, which some of you might have heard of. This was developed in the 60s by Hagkassel and Araki. And this was done to study conceptual problems of QFT on Minkowski space time. And the main idea was to encode all the physical information in a net of 
algebras. So the idea was that we take uh, subsets of uh, Minkowski space time and we assign to it uh, algebras of observables that can be measured uh, in this subset. So that was um, sort of physical intuition uh, around it. Uh, so for me, this, you know, the take home message from that is we should assign algebraic data to open subsets of space time. Okay, and uh, what's cool about it for me is that uh, you want to define those uh, algebras of observables abstractly without uh, going into Hilbert space representation. So the algebraic viewpoint, what it really is about, uh, algebras come first and Hilbert spaces come later. So instead of fixing the Hilbert space first and then considering, uh, let's say, bounded operators on it or whatever unbounded operators you're fond of, uh, this is a bit uh, the other way around. So uh, we say what our algebras are completely independently of uh, Hilbert space representations. And then we get into the discussion of Hilbert space representations later when we specify physical states that we are interested in studying. So that's uh, what I'm taking out from this algebraic approach. And of course, there's the problem of locality. Uh, AQFT per design uh, is a theory of local physics. So the way it was uh, intentionally uh, designed, the way it was meant was to describe local things. I'm, I'm a terrible person. I'm going to break that locality and I'm not ashamed of it at all. Um, but let's first explain what locality means in AQFT. So it could mean two things. So first is localization, which means that our observables would be localized in bounded regions of space time. So M can now be any space time whatsoever. We can go uh, outside of Minkowski, nothing keeping us. Um, so uh, yeah, localization means that everything is kind of attached to bounded regions. And the other uh, meaning of the word locality in AQFT is causality. So this means that observables assigned to space-like separated regions have to commute. So here I have space-like separated regions O and O prime. And the idea would be that uh, observables assigned to these regions would commute. Now, how things can go wrong? Well, the first thing, namely the localization, can go wrong very quickly. So consider a theory like quantum electrodynamics with long range interactions. This is already a situation where you cannot keep to that strict notion of localization. Uh, you cannot have things localized in bounded regions of space time. You have to have things localized in some larger regions for example, uh, string-like regions or cone-like regions, or even like the whole space-time wedges. So this, this has been realized pretty quickly uh, and in AQFT one deals with that sort of locality breaking. So one considers um, fields, one considers observables that are localized in more bizarre and bounded regions. Uh, and the second thing is much more serious and this, the obvious way in which uh, this causality can break is that if all the observables of interest happen to be localized in all of space then, because you can still talk about causality if you are actually able to, you know, localize uh, observables in regions that can in principle be space-like to each other. But if all the observables are localized everywhere, there is no way to fit, you know, two space-like uh, localization regions then obviously you have to say bye-bye to causality. And this is somehow the expectation that observables, the kind of observables we uh, want to consider in quantum gravity would be of that sort. So the localization is gone. Uh, now the good news, there is always some good news, is that uh, the standard methods uh, we are using for constructing AQFT models are still applicable even if these types of locality are broken. So um, even though what you get in the end is not an AQFT in the usual meaning of the word, you can still construct some algebras. You can still 
construct observables and compute uh, various things about them, for example, their correlations, their expectation values in states and so on. Uh, so what I want to talk about today is one particular method for constructing AQFT models, which is called perturbative AQFT. And this method can also be applied to uh, non-local observables. And this has been uh, one of my occupations for a while was to understand these guys better. So perturbative algebraic quantum field theory, that's the framework I'm working in. Uh, there are many good things about it. So one is that, well, you know, I'm a mathematician, right? I have a job at the math department, so I have to be doing something mathematically rigorous, otherwise I would get into terrible uh, trouble. Um, but it's it's not, not just that, it's also a quite practical framework for doing things. So uh, it allows to use methods of perturbative QFT with Feynman diagrams, normal power series, and so on, uh, to construct things which end up being mathematically rigorous. So uh, you get both uh, ends of the game. So you get mathematical rigor, but you also have some uh, applications. Uh, there is a question in the chat. Is that correct or? No, OK. Uh, so let me mention the main contributions in uh, this framework. I wasn't the one who came up with the idea. Uh, there was a lot done in the early 2000s uh, by Dijkstra and Hagen and Brunette in various combinations. Uh, the idea first was to use the formation quantization. I'm going to talk about it later on to construct the quantum theory from the classical theory by uh, deforming certain algebraic structures by deforming a product. I'm going to come back to this later. Then uh, QFT typically implies renormalization. And there is a very neat approach to renormalization due to Epstein Glaser from the 70s, which uh, allows one to uh, do things in a bit more systematic way. You don't have to subtract infinities of each other. Um, it's more uh, like a well-posed mathematical problem that you can then solve with some freedom left. And finally, uh, there are full methods of homological algebra that you can apply. Uh, and this is useful in generalization of all that business to gauge theory. So these are the works of uh, Holland and by Tausman, Hagen, and myself. And if you want a review, uh, I wrote a book about it. It might be a bit on the mathematical side of things, uh, but still, it, it's a kind of summary of, of everything I'm going to talk about. So it might be a good reference later on if you're still uh, interested in learning more about this framework. OK, so um, what's the main message? What PAQFT tells us about observables? You can think of it as a machinery to turn classical observables, namely functionals of classical field configurations into quantum observables. So it's a machinery to produce quantum observables knowing the classical observables. Why is it good? Well, it means that uh, the choice of objects you want to study, so in quantum gravity case, we want things to be the homomorphism invariant, is made on the classical level where it's much more tractable and then there is a sort of um, you know, machinery. Uh, you turn the crank, and then you produce quantum observables out of that. So difficult problems, I mean, at least in that sense, are uh, solved on the classical level. So the aim is to study those aspects of observables in quantum gravity that are amenable to QFT methods. So as much as we can learn about those objects, even though uh, it's understood that this is uh, still only a glimpse on what the full theory would be. And ultimately, uh, I'm a quantum person. I live in the quantum world. So we want to do away with that classical picture and have a intrinsically quantum formulation. Uh, but obviously, that's kind of more tricky for constructing models. So many of the methods we use for constructing models start with the classical theory. Has advantages. 
Okay, so that's the manifesto of perturbative AQSP. And let me now um, tell you more details about uh, observables. So uh, as I said, in this approach, you solve problems on the classical level. So let me tell you what are the classical diffeomorphism invariant observables in uh, general relativity and how to uh, turn them into quantum ones. So uh, let's set the stage a bit. Uh, we have a manifold M with a metric G and observables are some functions of the metric, right? Things that we can measure about that metric. Uh, and for mathematical convenience, I will assume them to be smooth. I can differentiate them as much as I want. Um, and in particular, there are the local ones and I'm going to use the term strictly local because this is the sort of most restrictive notion of locality uh, I'm going to use. So we can write those observables as some functions of the finite jet of your metric, which means they depend on uh, derivatives of G up to a fixed order. So uh, these are like typical, you know, local functionals out of uh, the textbook. Uh, and this is not good, not good at all, because uh, requiring this strict locality is in conflict with the homomorphism invariant. At least if we are talking about non-compact manifolds, which is uh, kind of what we are doing in Lorentzian signature, we, uh, well, for this uh, function here to be well-defined, it will have to be compactly supported. You can see it has to have compact support. And uh, that uh, is something which breaks the form of his invariant. So that support could move around uh, under the form of his and that would spoil uh, the diffeomorphism invariance, unfortunately. So non-compact manifolds, this cannot work as a diffeomorphism observables, no way. However, one can uh, consider a slightly weaker notion, which is good for some things, uh, but also can, at least in principle, be diffeomorphism invariant, which is uh, we can consider observables whose derivatives are local. So you can think of it this way, uh, it's locally local, okay? This is a very silly way of saying it. Uh, so each at each point, you can consider all the derivatives, uh, all the functional derivatives, all the variations of your functionals, and these depend locally on those perturbations, those variations. Uh, but then when you move to a different point, uh, then this dependence can change. Uh, so good news is that this notion of locality, weak locality is sufficient for things like perturbative renormalization in the sense of epstein glaser So this is amenable to the methods I'm fond of. Uh, on the other hand, you can construct the form of this invariant objects which satisfy that condition. So, hey, we, we, have, a, we have a way to go. Uh, and what I want to do now is to tell you more about uh, these objects. So uh, what kind of observables we can construct which uh, satisfy this silly condition. And these are uh, relational observables. Uh, I will try to argue that um, the class of observables we are constructing this way deserve the name relational. Uh, so I will first explain uh, how these are constructed, then uh, tell you how these are quantized in a bit of a sketchy way because it's a rather technical story. And then I will pass to another kind of observables if there is enough time left. Okay, uh, any questions up to this point? Okay. Excuse me. Sorry, do you hear me? Yes, I do. You said that you there, so you we have an assignment uh, to each like um, uh, sub subset O, uh, C star algebra or an algebra. Um, yeah, my question is: Do we know such assignments exist in principle, or yes, uh, or do we construct them? 
yeah, I mean, like silly uh, assignments do exist. I mean, you can you can okay. something something really really stupid um, assign, uh, you know, just uh, the same algebra uh, yeah. of, of matrices to every every open. Um, mm -hmm. Physical physical models is a different story. Uh, there is a bit of a shortage of models uh, with C star algebras. Uh, so there are many models in two dimensions and only free theory in four dimensions. However, uh, the thing I'm talking about, perturbative AQST drops that uh, C star requirement. So we don't have to have C star algebras. We can have any uh, unital uh, involutive algebras, which implies that there is much more room for constructing models and indeed, you know, interacting scalar fields, uh, standard model, um, many, many, you know, physical theories, you know, actually fit into that framework, produce mm -hmm. such uh, assignments of algebra. So for local theories, for uh, QFT models, this is not an issue. Uh, the issue arises uh, in models where you want diffeomorphism invariants, such as uh, perturbative quantum gravity, where just the notion of observables becomes more tricky. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, and yeah, there is a there is a uh, abundance of models. And is that is the assignment functorial in any way? Uh, it is. Yeah, correct. Okay. It is. Thank you. Uh, but yeah, I don't want to go into technical details. We can we can discuss it later in discussion. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Hello. Hello. Hi. <laughs> Hi. I can I ask a question? A quick sure. question. Hi, Lee. Hi. Do you consider observables having to do with the homonymy of the connection of the metric and its topology? Um, I could. <laughs> you could. Yes. That there yeah. are many, many diffeomorphism invariant functional. Yeah. Yeah. I, I could. I mean, these are uh, not particularly smooth. Uh, so, so maybe not not the first thing uh, I would put on the plate. Uh, I think for this formulation, the relational observables work much better uh, in in many respects. Also, like the ones you mentioned, wouldn't satisfy this uh, sort of weaker locality uh, condition. Sure, they wouldn't. So, yeah, okay. so that's, that's back. why I would I would shelve them for now. Okay, I, I would gently say that they're very smooth, depending on the measure you use. But we. Can oh, okay, that. okay, sure, sure. You can always I it. think, I think discussing the, discussing the measure will be a whole other uh, cup of tea thank and um, Fine, thank might you. take a bit longer. For future reference, if you have a question and raise your hand or put it in the chat, then I can actually interrupt Kasha and. Um, yeah, have a little I bit of not, control over what's going on. Yeah, so. I, I don't, uh, I don't see <laughs> what's going on. So yeah, yeah. But, um, so. Okay, uh, so I can continue with the relational observables. And again, let me set the stage. So we have something very general here. Uh, we have some theory of gravity coupled to matter, uh, optionally. Uh, so all the matter fields that would denote by phi because I don't care about indices and metric is G and the collective of metric plus matter is gamma. Uh, so now I want to uh, consider some parametrization of point of space time. So this is like fixing a coordinate system in terms of four scalars that depend on this, uh, you know, multiplet G and the matter field. And okay, we are in four dimensions, so I need four of them, and they are labeled by mu from zero to three. Okay, and they, uh, as a collection of uh, scalars, uh, they transform uh, under the homomorphisms by right multiplication. So you can, uh, so when you pull back all your matter fields and metric by a homomorphism, then this results to a coordinate transformation for, for this uh, gamma dependent coordinate system just by composing with that DPO. So that's very useful. Um, and so this is also related uh, to uh, one of the previous talks of uh, William Donnelly, 
uh, where there was the mention of um, the choice of observer, uh, the choice of a reference frame that then became a quantum observer and quantum reference frame. Um, I think this is very similar in flavor and especially when you look at the transformation law, this is exactly the same transformation law I require for these things. Um, so I think this, there might be a connection out there. Um, so the way I want to uh, think about those things, uh, I want to do it perturbatively because in general, uh, there's it's kind of hard to find globally a good uh, set of, of such uh, fields that provide you a good coordinate system globally. So I'm going to say the following, uh, I choose a background which provides you a good coordinate system. And then I look at perturbations around that background. So gamma zero is a background metric plus values of background fields such that um, your coordinate system uh, defined by those x mu is indeed a good coordinate system. And then I consider perturbations by this little gamma. And uh, now here's the trick, at least one of the tricks. Uh, so I do the following. So I use x gamma zero to go from uh, my space time m to r4. And then I use x gamma to go back. So uh, alpha gamma is just some map from the space time to itself. That doesn't look very exciting for now. Uh, what's cool about it is the way it transforms under formal deformorphism. So it transforms by a left multiplication uh, with the inverse of uh, the deformorphism. This is nice to, to, to be able to produce that factor of uh, chi minus one. Uh, and then I choose any other scalar. Uh, so I denote it by a gamma. This is any other scalar constructed uh, out of the metric and out of my matter field that I have to my disposal. And then take uh, the composition of that a gamma of x. x is the point of space time. So a gamma depends on the point. I can pull it back to my map alpha. So. Uh, yeah, I put all these ingredients together. And the fun thing is that the resulting quantity, which becomes uh, very non-local, uh, is now invariant under the form of it. Why? Because A gamma itself transforms by right multiplication by chi and alpha gamma by left multiplication with chi minus one. So they cancel out. So I get this invariant quantity. So these are the kinds of objects I want to uh, think of. And I want to view them as relational observables in the following way. So these are some field and metric configuration dependent coordinates. So taking this uh, combination, so A gamma composed with uh, the inverse of that, um, is uh, corresponds to thinking of what's the value of my scalar A provided that those uh, four coordinates have a certain fixed value. So uh, you, you're really thinking of relations between those four scalars that define you your coordinate system and uh, those uh, other fields, other scalars you, you have in the game. Uh, and, you know, the idea of relational or partial observables is not a new idea at all. So I should uh, credit probably much more people, but let me just mention the names of Edithi, uh, Giesel, Bohelli, and Seaman. Uh, these are works in mostly in, um, in loop quantum gravity, but the idea of having relational observables is actually much broader than that. And here I just spell out um, how uh, concrete uh, functional concrete observables can be constructed. So I choose uh, a scalar A, I choose uh, the observer X, and then uh, construct this um, combination, uh, which gives me 
necessarily a gamma and then smear it with some test function to uh, get something uh, well defined. And this time, so this is non local, and this can be the homomorphism invariant because the x here, the point is actually moving around under the homomorphism. So because I'm using coordinates which are intrinsic, which are dependent on matter fields or on metric scalars, uh, they transform with the rest of the system. So the resulting object uh, is actually uh, invariant. Uh, Lisa, do you have a question? Um, well, I got a question sent sure. to me. So um, the question is, if x mu are coordinates, then don't they depend on the metric? They might. Yes, correct. Yes. So gamma, uh, gamma is this whole multiplet containing metric and matter field. Correct. Um, OK. So uh, any other question? All right. Uh, so yeah, I rely on Lisa to uh, relate to me. Any questions? OK. Uh, there right. was another message. You oh. don't have to send them to me as direct message. You can put them in the general chat. But the next question is, are the scalars x necessarily dynamical degrees of freedom? Um, they uh, Well, I mean, they should be constructed they have to be constructed from dynamical degrees of freedom uh, because otherwise they wouldn't uh, really transform under symmetry transformations. So the philosophy here is that symmetries only act on uh, dynamical degrees of freedom. Uh, so, so yeah, so they, they, should, they should be dynamical. Okay. Anything else? I'm not sure. Lee unmuted himself. I'm not sure if that is an uh, accident it's or a quick you... question. Uh -huh. okay. No, it's a quick question. Do, uh, do you know any sets of these that have nice algebras so you can quantize them? Yes, I'm going to come to this. Uh, so maybe the uh, first, first part of the answer is that uh, all, the, all the fields, all the, uh, well, yeah, so I, I just gave you a general prescription, right? But this general prescription already uh, guarantees that if those x mu's and uh, those other scalars are local functions of uh, the metric and um, the uh, matter fields, then they can be quantized. So uh, I can use the usual methods of epstein glasser renormalization to quantize those perturbatively. So as long as X's and A's uh, depend locally on uh, the whole gamma multiplet, then I can use my methods of perturbative randomization. Uh, so that's the first statement. And the second statement is, hey, examples. Um, so so here, here are the examples for this can be done. So if you have, if you don't want matter fields, I love matter fields, but if you don't want them for some reason, uh, then you can use, uh, well, some uh, scalars constructed from the metric. Of course, there is a caveat that your background has to be some sort of generic background with uh, uh, minimal symmetry or no symmetry at best, because uh, otherwise you would have problems with getting those X's to be injected. So, uh, that's, yeah, so of course, the easiest way to do perturbation theory is on the nice symmetric background like Minkowski, but then you don't have all those uh, curvature scalars as a good coordinate system, so you have to make a trade-off. Uh, so that's the problem with not having matter. But if you do have matter, okay, then you have much more freedom. So you can uh, either have just, you know, four scalar fields coupled to the metric. This is a sort of brute force approach of, uh, yeah, why don't we just use four scalars? Uh, of course, in the standard model, you have much more than four scalars. So in, in the real world, there is a lot of fields to pick up from. Uh, also, you can consider dust fields, like in the brown kuhash model. So these also would work well 
in in that context. There are also the, the the works of Bergman and Bergman Homer. So it, it's all like it's nothing new in this, but uh, you you can use those results to uh, construct examples of of fields of, of the kind of interest. Group. And there is also a more recent work with my collaborators on cosmological perturbation theory, where we just considered um, the coupling, uh, well, of, of uh, one scalar to um, the metric on the cosmological background. Uh, and there we have constructed uh, observables which are uh, diff invariant to all orders and to lower lowest order they um, reconstruct, they replicate what one knows about cosmological observables. So for example, there is uh, an observable which up to lowest order is uh, the Mukan of Sezaki variable. Uh, so this is more in terms of examples. And there are also works uh, by Marcus Klub and his collaborators uh, on the similar uh, topics so constructing uh, observables of this type and uh, quantizing them as well using these uh, Epstein Glaser like methods. Um, okay, so I think that's all in terms of examples for now. Uh, yeah, okay, maybe that's a, another uh, good moment to stop for questions. Lisa, is there anything else? Uh, nothing anyone has written to me yet, so I'm assuming it was very clear so far. Fantastic. Okay, so now, so so these are the classical objects I'm interested in, and I told you that I can quantize them. So I want to tell you something about how I quantize them. Uh, and I do realize that this part of the talk is going to be uh, slightly more technical. Uh, so uh, I, I would, yeah, I wouldn't mind <laughs> interruptions. Uh, if I don't get to the end of all my slides, this is also fine. Uh, but I want to, I want you to be on, on board with what I'm saying. And I do realize that uh, this maybe is a bit more mathematical than uh, you're used to. Okay. Uh, so, but let's start with physics. Uh, I'm I'm going to construct this mathematical model, but first uh, I need some input data about what this model should describe. So. Uh, I'm doing this QFT on curve space-time business. Um, so first of all, I need some globally hyperbolic space-time, so space-time with a Cauchy surface as the background and some background metric G. If I'm doing perturbative quantum gravity, then this is the background metric and my uh, classical field and then quantum field is going to be metric perturbations. Then I need to specify uh, what kind of objects I have in the game. So do I have scalar fields, vector fields, tensors? So this is uh, called the configuration space. And I use the notation E for that. And as we know, uh, this is typically uh, just a space of smooth sections of some vector bundle. So fields, right, as we know, are uh, sections of various vector bundles. For example, for the scalar field, um, we have just smooth functions on the manifold. For perturbative uh, gravity, we have uh, metric perturbations. So these are examples of uh, configuration spaces. And finally, we need some dynamics. And uh, my approach, well, the approach I'm using for dynamics is a uh, covariant Lagrangian approach. Uh, so you use Lagrangian as an input, and then uh, you construct uh, some. Poisson bracket, Poisson structure in a covariant way. Uh, yeah, you, you could also, in principle, you could also do things in the Hamiltonian approach, uh, but that is less convenient because although you do have a Cauchy surface, you do not want to uh, break covariance. You don't want to pick a foliation into Cauchy surfaces. Uh, ideally, one stays completely covariant all the time. So that's why I'm avoiding Hamiltonian because that would. Uh, it, that will require making some, some choices, which are awkward. Uh, also for gravity, the Hamiltonian might vanish and then what? Uh, so yeah, so Lagrangian approach is what I'm going to do. 
And here is some overview of how I use these ingredients to build models. So uh, first of all, observables. And as I said before, these are some functions uh, on the space of configurations. So I will denote them just by F. This is my favorite space of functions on uh, configurations. And aha, another important bit, uh, I take all the offshore configurations. At the moment, I'm not requiring any dynamics. Nobody has to be at the solutions of any equations of the motion. Everybody can get in, you know, and, and then we talk about dynamics later. Okay, so, uh, so the space of F is functional on all the configurations, irrespective of uh, any uh, equations of motion. But now I do need to put some dynamical input. And this dynamical input is provided uh, by uh, the construction of the pairs bracket. So here is what I do. Uh, so somebody gave me uh, the Lagrangian, the action functional for my theory. Uh, I linearize it. Uh, and after linearizing it, I get some dynamical equations. And uh, I want that person to give me a good Lagrangian. And the good Lagrangian is Lagrangian for which I can construct retarded and advanced green function. This is um, kind of useful in this approach. Let's see if I can annotate things in a sensible way. Uh, okay. Let's see if I can do that. Yeah, so what does it mean, retarded and advanced green functions? It means that uh, if I have uh, some test function f, which kind of models my initial data, uh, my source, then applying retarded green function would propagate the support to the future, and applying advanced green function would propagate the support to the past. So a nice theory uh, after linearizing the action provides me with equations which have those retarded and advanced green functions. And then uh, the difference between retarded and advanced uh, gives me uh, the basis for uh, the Peyer's bracket gives me the Poisson structure. Uh, and this difference has various names. Um, it, some people call it causal propagator. Some people call it a uh, pauli function, which is a more correct name. Uh, but in principle, it's something which will become commutator after quantization. And for classical theory, it gives you the bracket. If you're asking yourself, uh, why don't we use the canonical bracket? You know, as we learned in, in classical mechanics, this is what one does. Uh, again, I want to remind you we are working fully for variance, so I don't want to do any foliation in Cauchy surfaces. But if, uh, if I could do that, then this bracket, at least on the space of on-shell configurations, would be equivalent to canonical bracket on the Cauchy data. So this is nothing else as doing the usual classical mechanics, but with slightly more infinite dimensional spaces. OK, so that's my classical theory. Uh, let's see. How am I standing with time? You've got about 20 more minutes, assuming that we started five minutes late and um, giving you the 10 minutes. Yeah, the 10 minutes for questions are happening during the talk already. And then there's a half hour discussion afterwards. So awesome. OK, so Looking that, good. Was, that was the classical theory. Um, and now I want to quantize it really quickly on the slide. Uh, I'm, I'm doing the formation quantization. Uh, so here is what it is. If you've never heard of it, that that is maybe you know the, the first thing you learn about the formation quantization. Um, so first of all, I want to allow uh, you know things to be a bit formal. So my quantum observables are going to be uh, formal power series in H bar. Uh, formal because I don't want to be bothered with convergence of things. I've done enough functional analysis in my life, so this is this is sufficient for now. Uh, and on those, I want to define a product, a non-commutative product, which uh, is going to uh, 
act uh, as uh, you know the operator product in quantum mechanics would behave. So what do I mean by that? Well, in uh, the lowest order in H bar, this quantum product should be the same as the classical product, so nicely commutative. Uh, and in the first order in H bar, uh, a commutator with this product uh, divided by IH bar should give me uh, the classical Poisson bracket. So I'm deforming my uh, product of uh, observables, my classical product into quantum product in such a way that uh, the bracket becomes the commutator. And this is very much like, you know, the, the Dirac put the hat on things quantization would work uh, with uh, the caveat that here, I also allow for things to have higher orders in H bar. So this statement doesn't mean that the commutator is exactly I H bar times the Poisson bracket. It means it's that up to higher orders in H bar. And that extra leeway is actually um, uh, going around things like uh, no-go theorems, uh, which say that you know the naive hat quantization would not work. Okay, so deformation quantization. And uh, the good thing about it is that we are working with the same vector space of functionals. So this is kind of you know brought forward from uh, the classical theory but we give it different algebraic structures. So uh, we uh, have this Poisson bracket in the classical theory, and we have the star product in the quantum. And this, as I said, also works for these non-local uh, relational observables I mentioned before. Uh, okay, so uh, here is an example of uh, a nice dynamic. So for Free scalar field, you have uh, equations of motion which are uh, essentially the wave equation. These are well, these are the good ones, um, and the good ones are typically, in some way, uh, variations on the wave equation. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so you might want to uh, change things a bit. So for uh, particular, oh, well, okay, so for uh, practical construction of the star product. So here I just told you what it does. Uh, if you want to construct it in practice, uh, you need some more structure. Uh, so you have this delta, uh, but you also need to choose something which corresponds to normal ordering. And uh, from mathematical viewpoint is the choice of a uh, complex structure on uh, the configuration space. And from a slightly more physical viewpoint, uh, it would correspond to uh, the choice of two-point function uh, for a state on that uh, well on, on that free uh, theory. So there is some more work that one has to do in order to define the star product, but uh, this work has been done by other people. Uh, so the free theory can be nicely quantized. These star products exist, and you can. Uh, write them down uh, pretty easily. Uh, and this is where uh, the more complicated matter starts. So assuming I have quantized my linearized theory, my free theory, uh, this is not the end of the game because all the fun is in the interaction. So in order to introduce the interaction, uh, this is uh, where this epstein glaser story uh, comes in. So I want to construct objects called uh, formal S matrices in terms of uh, time ordered products, renormalized time ordered products. Uh, if you had some uh, former experience with quantum field theory, you probably know what time ordered products are. Uh, but in short, uh, you can think of them as time ordered versions of this uh, star product we had before, just order uh, the arguments in time. And to construct those time ordered products, uh, I'm using the Epstein Glaser renormalization, which I'm not going to elaborate on, uh, maybe in discussion if you're interested. Uh, but again, this is a machinery that one understands well. You feed in 
uh, you know, your interaction. And then this everything does randomization produces things like, uh, for example, this formal S matrix for that interaction. And fun fact, it also works for theories which are power counting non-renormalizable. Non uh, so you can apply it to effective quantum gravity if you want to. It's, so it's yeah. Um, I'm going to do something a little bit mean. I'm giving you your 10 minute warning and then I'm asking a question straight away that I got via chat, which is, um, is the star product uniquely determined by the previously listed properties? No, uh, there is in fact lots of freedom. So here uh, I mentioned this choice of complex structure. Uh, so uh, this is part of the freedom. In fact, uh, your uh, yeah, the, 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 the freedom is very large. It essentially would uh, allow you to add uh, any uh, by solutions to uh, equations of motion of this form. So there is a lot of freedom, but we are not worried about this freedom because all these choices give isomorphic algebras. They are all equivalent in uh, from the algebraic viewpoint. So there is freedom, but the freedom is not really um, affecting physics. <laughs> Great, thank you. Yeah. So then you have 10 more minutes. Fantastic. Okay, so uh, just very quick to finish on uh, the quantization. Uh, there is also a prescription due to uh, Bogolyubov on how to construct interacting fields, interacting observables in that framework. So um, given uh, a classical, uh, innocent observable F, you can construct uh, the interacting one of the quantum theory with the interaction V uh, by taking this funny combination of uh, two S matrices. One is the S matrices where your observable uh, acts as a perturbation and the other is the inverse of the original S matrix. Um, there's some more uh, intuition behind that. Uh, it's kind of designed to emulate Gelman law formula. Um, so there are reasons for this to look this way, but uh, again, I don't have enough time to actually go into detail. Uh, the, the thing is that there is a prescription and it does work also for um, some kind of relational observables I talked about before. Um, yeah, you can construct, but then in the next step, you can construct states on uh, algebras of such interacting observables. Um, again, let me just uh, go quickly through that. And uh, finally, you can uh, compute correlation functions. Uh, so having a state, which for example, could be an um, evaluation at a given configuration. Having a state, you can compute correlation functions of uh, free fields, but you can also use that uh, formula for the interacting fields to compute interacting correlation functions. So with all that input, you can actually, um, you know, run the whole machinery until the point uh, you have actual numbers coming up. Okay, and what about gravity? Well, uh, as I said, everything works also for these uh, relational observables, which are non-local, but with local derivatives. Um, and the details on that can be found in my paper with Brunetti Fernhagen Hagen uh, from 2016. Uh, and okay, if you're worried about things depending on this splitting into free and interacting theory, uh, rest assured we have checked that they don't. Uh, so uh, the correlations of interacting observables don't depend on that splitting. We have shown that in our paper. Uh, in the more recent work with Eli Hawkins, we have actually found a more abstract uh, general reason why this is the case. So you can have a look at that if you're interested. Uh, okay, so that part actually finishes uh, relational observables. And I want to use maybe the last uh, five minutes just to uh, give some remarks on another kind of observables I'm interested in namely uh, the dressed observables. So that, that's all like 
you know, one part of the story. Uh, this is another part of the story. Uh, so here I'm starting with another of, of my favorite topics, which is uh, QED. And uh, in QED, as I said, we already have this uh, breaking of localization. Uh, so electrons, uh, they, they are not, uh, you know, completely uh, free to go. They always uh, come accompanied by a cloud of low energy soft photons. So we say that they are dressed particles. Uh, and okay, some features like that we expect that would also appear in uh, quantum gravity. Uh, and that issue with, you know, electrons being dressed in soft photons, this is related to the infrared problem of QED. And this has been a pain in the neck for a while. And there are many people in QFT who contributed to that. Uh, I just uh, mentioned a few names here. This is far from being a complete list. Uh, and in particular, uh, I want to mention Andrzej Hardegen from Krakow, which was a very influential figure in, in my initial formation as a scientist. Uh, so he uh, advocates the idea that uh, the AQST locality paradigm should be broken, and it should be broken in a way uh, to um, accommodate for those long range effects. Uh, so the idea is that, uh, you know, you have to also in the long range interaction situation, you have to also quantize the asymptotic degrees of freedom. So think of those as living at the boundary at infinity and uh, allow for coupling of these asymptotic degrees of freedom to, um, you know, the more you <laughs> usual uh, degrees of freedom you can think of uh, doses living in the box. Uh, so that's at least how I understand this idea uh, after thinking about it myself. And after thinking about it a bit more recently, uh, I uh, realized that uh, maybe the way to go is to use a very powerful framework of maybe the Z formalism and uh, I want to mention people who work on that. So Petanio, Nev, Rishitikin, Skiavina, many others. Uh, so they have this very powerful tool for quantizing theories with boundaries. And uh, together with Michele Schiavina, we have applied that to quantize QED with asymptotic degrees of freedom. So to take that idea seriously. Uh, although maybe quantize is a bit uh, too much, uh, we have laid out the classical theory, which is now quantization ready. Uh, but one has to start somewhere. And next, we want to do this for gravity. And we also want to perform quantization, uh, which is uh, now the work is in progress with Michele. Uh, but essentially, we want to follow that program. And finally, we want to connect uh, that to other ideas about dress observables, which I found very inspiring. So there is this paper of the Nelly and Giddings, for example. And uh, yeah, there was uh, also uh, the recent work of Hallow and Wu um, about covariant phase space uh, with boundaries, which I also want to understand in that context. Uh, okay, so I mentioned, so this is the list of main ideas. The rest of the talk was more technical matter. So I think nothing bad happens if I just skip it. Uh, especially because my clock says it's time. Uh, so let me just scroll to the end of this um, to have a brief summary. So uh, how PAQST can be useful for quantum gravity. Okay, so uh, algebraic methods of quantization are really powerful. So the formation quantization, DV formalism and so on, uh, because it allows you to separate the discussion of observables from the construction of states. And then you can have the same, of, the same observables, many states. So it, it also kind of splits two difficult problems apart. Um, it provides us with a way to turn classical observables into quantum observables, which is uh, relatively algorithmic. So uh, it can be applied um, straightforward if you know, you know the machinery. Uh, and finally, using this BVBFB uh, formalism, there are perspectives for understanding things like dressing and holography, which I'm really keen on. 
doing in the near future. Okay, so that's it. And thank you guys for your attention. Thank you very much for a fantastic talk. Um, you can all unmute yourself so we can applaud Kasha now. Oh, we have a little bit of time for a discussion and um, I've already gotten some questions. I'm seeing the first raised hand, but I had a question sent in the chat. So I'm calling on Lee first, please. If. Yes, hello. And thank you for that was a very clear, very beautiful talk. At some point, almost in passing, you said that uh, method of calculating your algebraic perturbation theory worked even with theories that were usually perturbatively not renormalizable. Correct. Power count. And Kash, I was, I was just curious, what, what exactly are you claiming? Are you claiming that you can do, compute a finite per, perturbation theory? Well, or this any is, theory? yeah, I mean, this is really I'm saying. So uh, you have two, formal parameters in the story. So one is the coupling constant and another one is H bar. Uh, so I'm claiming that in each order in H bar, um, you can uh, compute, you can perform this renormalization procedure. So you can contribute, sorry. So you can compute the counter terms uh, in each order in H bar, in each order in lambda. Uh, I'm not claiming that uh, you uh, that this ever stops. Uh, so it might happen that each order in H bar you get new type of parameter. So you get new corrections at each order, which is the usual uh, symptom of being uh, non renormalizable in the power counting um, sense. But for Epstein Glaser, the bar is lower. So the bar is that you're able to compute the contributions at each order. And you don't worry about the fact mm. that uh, you cannot sum up all orders. So in that sense. Mm -hmm. uh, so in the end, what you can get out of it is an effective theory. Uh, if you introduce a cutoff and say, OK, I'm done with con computing those corrections, uh, you can say that, yes, this is my effective theory. and. Uh, I'm happy with that. Okay, okay, great. But it depends on an infinite number of choices. Well, yeah, I mean, if you want to, right. So so if, that, that's why it's, it's just an effective theory. It cannot be, um, you know, a, a <laughs> final theory of everything. Uh, it's oh, it's good for great, studying some, some particular physical situations where these effects are, are not terribly huge. Okay, great. Um, thank you, Lee. The next question is Anto Anthony Speranza, please. Hi, Kasha. Hi. Thanks for the Hi. talk. Uh, I just had a couple of questions related to the Pyrrhals bracket. Um, uh -huh. uh, so the, I had two. One is, I think, just a clarification is, is if it's I think you said that it's defined even off shell, like for the whole configuration right. space. Oh, okay. So it's a little different from like a Poisson or uh, the symplectic structure in like a covariant phase space. Yeah, because that. it only lives, yeah, that one only lives on shell. Yeah, correct. Okay. And the other question I have is since you're using these greens functions, is does it involve um, a choice of gauge fixing to define those or? Uh, yeah. Those so, or so so right, there, there are things I swept under the rug. Uh, so in order to, to deal with gauge theories, you have to uh, add gauge fixing terms to the Lagrangian as per usual. Um, now I'm, I'm using this, this uh, machinery called BV formalism, which allows you to control or, or these extra degrees of freedom you're adding. And you can show that under certain uh, assumptions, your final product your theory you're constructing does not depend uh, on the choice of gauge fixing. So, so this is one of the convenient features of BV formalism. Uh, you have the thing called quantum master equation, which translates to 
uh, some family of word identities, you prove those word identities, you know that you're independent of the gauge fixing. So there is gauge fixing happening in the background, but the trick is to uh, show that you're nothing depends on it. Okay, so for that bracket, I can like parameterize it for each choice of gauge fixing and then. Yeah, so, so there's actually a very neat uh, result. Uh, I, yeah, so it, it's a bit abstract, but uh, if you, yeah, so, so you can know uh, the BV complex for the theory, which you can uh, kind of write down abstractly uh, without making the choice of gauge fixing. Uh, then you can uh, figure out the existence of the pious bracket uh, without making a particular choice of gauge fixing. So you can oh. actually show by abstract nonsense that the pious bracket exists, but abstract nonsense is abstract nonsense. If you want to compute it, then you should better have your gauge fix green function. Okay, yeah, thanks. Okay, great. Um, next, I think, Ayalam Balahandran had Hi. a question. Hi, Lisa, we have met in Bangalore. OK, yes. Um, okay. I'm sorry. I meet too many people. I. Uh... <laughs> OK, uh, my question is right here. You did not define the topology of the fields, what kind of algebra they form. And you nope. did not say what kind of states you allow. Are, are these normal states? I don't know. And finally, uh -huh. uh, one more question. Yeah. What is the star, the star product? Can I get the, the formal series using conservative approach? OK, so question number one. Uh, yeah, I did not define the topology. Uh, there is a nice topology on the space of uh, these functionals, uh, but it's only a locally convex topology. It's not, uh, it's not the norm space. It's not the Banach space. So um, that, that's why, I mean, this is not, not perfect. Uh, the algebras I get are uh, topological uh, star, uh, topological unical star algebras, uh, but they are not sister algebras. They are not von Neumann, unfortunately. Uh, so I guess in terms of states, um, there is, uh, yeah, so, so not, not normal states wouldn't make sense because uh, it's not, uh, a von Neumann algebra situation. Uh, I do consider um, Hadamard states. This is this has something to do with the singularity uh, structure of the two-point function. So the two-point function has to have the singularity of the vacuum uh, in Minkowski. This is essentially the condition of being Hadamard. So I allow for um, arbitrary Hadamard states. That was the state question and. Uh, which was, uh, there was one more question, sorry. Because <laughs> uh, about Konsevich, I mean. Oh yeah, Konsevich, So Konsevich uh, works perfectly for finite dimensional Poisson manifolds. Uh, for infinite dimensional manifolds, it is known that the Konsevich uh, formula fails uh, because, uh, yeah, so I guess, uh, it was shown, I think, by Beto uh, that you know there is this formula with diagrams and waves and things uh, for for the conservative product, and some of these terms would not be well defined in infinite dimension. Mm -hmm. So that doesn't work. Uh, so we do much more hands-on uh, approach. So in in the quadratic case, in the free theory, we just use the the weil Vi formula. Uh, which is perfectly fine. And for the interacting product, um, we just make a further deformation of, of that free product. But this is more sort of specialized uh, toolkit. It's, it's very particular to having, uh, you know, a theory coming from uh, Lagrangian uh, and having those green functions in the linearized case. So um, yeah, Th this actually, I can give you a reference, uh, sorry, this is a bit of scrolling going on here. Um, this paper with Eli Hawkins, uh, no, not yet. Uh, yeah, this one. So this paper of Eli Hawkins in Letters in Mathematical Physics, uh, we actually do discuss the relation to Concevich, uh, okay. if you're interested in that. Okay, so may I ask, 
you said that all these star products you are writing are isomorphic. Correct. What in what sense are they isomorphic? Uh, oh, uh, in the sense that there, I mean, in the sense of deformation quantization, there is a gauge transformation relating them. So uh, they, yeah, it, there is a uh, there is a star isomorphism, well, formal star isomorphism uh, mm -hmm. relating those those products. Okay. Uh, one final remark. I have seen long ago this uh, idea of get, uh, restoring the problem of, I mean, solving the problem of uh, infrared divergences in QED. I have seen a very old work by Bialinitsky Birula, okay? uh -huh. uh, where he explicitly wrote down the coupling to the uh, test functions in the apparatus and showed that that uh, uh, resolves the issue of infrared divergences. Okay? Yeah, so, so, so there is, uh, there is, so. Infrared divergences is a subset of the infrared problem. So infrared problem has, has many uh, facets. So from the AQFT perspective, the main issue is uh, sort of classifying representations of um, you know, the, the uh, local algebras uh, in terms of charges. So the, the existence of uh, yeah, super selection sectors uh, and how these super selection sectors behave. Um, th this is more sort of algebraic side of, of the infrared problem. Uh, so, so yeah, I mean, infrared divergences is one of the symptoms, uh, but just solving infrared divergences doesn't entirely sort out uh, the rest of the infrared problem. Okay. Does the GNS construction apply when you don't have a C-star algebra? Sure. Yeah, it applies to, to unit star algebra. Yes, it does. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, there's another question in the chat by Maximilian Rüb. Oh, you... <laughs> okay. Sorry. Hi, Kasia. Thanks for the nice talk. Um, I wondered what uh, the next steps are or would be uh, to, to make contact with asymptotic safety. Oh, uh, yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, so there are many ways to go. I mean, uh, yeah, so, so there is a bit of Euclidean versus Lorentzian situation. Uh, so one way to go would be to uh, try to apply these methods I, I was talking about in Euclidean signature so that you can use them in the asymptotic safety program. So that's one way to go. Another way to go is to try to establish something like asymptotic safety in Lorentzian, which I think is not an easy problem uh, from, from what, what I'm going to understand. Uh, but yeah, this, yeah so, so these will be the two natural things to try. And I would be very curious to uh, see what comes out of it. I, I'm really interested in finding out. Okay, great. Um, I don't have any more questions at the moment. Um, I think you just explained everything so well. And, uh, <laughs> or unless... so badly. <laughs> There's always two possibilities. No, no, it was not badly explained. So, <laughs> okay. um, are there any more questions now? Uh, raise your hand, unmute your microphone, throw it into the chat. Um, if not, this might be the first time we did not go insanely over time with our discussion. <laughs> I am very surprised by that, but not unpleasantly, my tea is empty after all. <laughs> I have a question that's not directly related to the talk, but uh, since we have the time, sure. I'm interested to hear uh, about your experience as an Emmy Nerther scholar. Uh -huh. Okay, <laughs> it was it was awesome. I mean, uh, yeah, I, I really liked it. I love perimeter. I, I hope to be able to go back, uh, you know, when it's possible to go back. Um, I think it was very good. Uh, I'm, you see, I'm. I'm in a math department, uh, which has good things and bad things about it. Uh, the bad thing about it is that I don't get to talk uh, to many physicists on a regular basis. 
and our physics department here in New York is actually uh, doing uh, a very different kind of physics. Uh, so it gave me an opportunity to uh, talk to people actually working on quantum gravity, quantum field theory, so the areas of physics I'm really interested in. And it's such a, such a broad spectrum of topics, interests, people. So it was always like incredibly stimulating and a lot of fun. Thank you. And this is advertising for the Emmy Nutter program. <laughs> Never hurt. Yeah, I had my eye on it. <laughs> um, and thank you for this talk. It was nicely paced and like um, just very clear. I appreciate it. Okay, thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Um, if there are no more questions, um, well, if there are more questions that you think of later, we do have a Slack channel again for the talk. So you can join us there and ask more questions and we will encourage Kasha to also go there and see what you're writing. There has been a bit of discussion already in the Slack channels for the first four to uh, three talks. We will also post the YouTube link to the recording in case you want to go back, look at something some more. And of course, there will be a next talk in the series. Our next talk will be um, by Renate Loll, and it will be about observables in quantum gravity models on the computer a little bit more. We don't have a date for the talk yet. We expect it to be in roughly a month, but um, well, up to fluctuations as everything is these t days. And also after Renate's talk, we will have a, well, as the next to next talk, we will have a panel discussion for which we are hoping to invite back most of our speakers and hope to also see most of our audience again, since it's your great questions that are making the discussions after the talks the best. Um, otherwise, yes, uh, enjoy the rest of your evening, rest of your day, rest of your night, depending on which time zone you're in. Thank you again, Kasha. It was a great talk. Thank you. Thanks for organizing this. And uh, yeah, see you next seminar. See you next time.